not a problem. While scrolling through your social media feed, you probably more than likely watched a video of Miss Kimberly uh, breaking down the history of economic oppression in America by equating it to a game of Monopoly. Simple enough, right? Let's take a look. If I right now decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you, and for 400 rounds of playing Monopoly, I didn't allow you to have any money, I didn't allow you to have anything on the board, I didn't allow for you to have anything, and then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly, and everything that you gained and you earned while you were playing that round of Monopoly was taken from you. That was Tulsa, that was Rosewood, there are pla those are places where we built black economic wealth, where we were self-sufficient, where we owned our stores, where we owned our property, and they burned them to the ground. So that's 450 years. So for 400 rounds of Monopoly, you don't get to play at all. Not only do you not get to play, you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against. You have to play and make money and earn wealth for them, and then you have to turn it over to them. Well now, let's unpack the history of economic oppression in America. Kimberly, it's your video, so I say you go first. What made you do a video comparing America's economic oppression to Monopoly? The interesting thing about that video is that that was not something that was like pre-planned or that I had, you know, a speech I had put together. I was helping a friend with his documentary. He was trying to like capture some of the aftermath um, after the rioting took place in Atlanta and I was doing interviews and truthfully how that video came to be is I was struck. I was actually upset because I've continuously tried to plan cleanups in, in you know, um, marginalized black neighborhoods in Atlanta and just could not get the amount of people necessary to volunteer to participate. And I went out to do this with him and I noticed all of these people, African-American people, out cleaning up from the aftermath of what happened in Atlanta, getting the graffiti off the wall, sweeping up the, sweeping up the glass, doing all of this stuff. And it really upset me because I'm like, I haven't been able to coordinate these people to actually clean up our communities, yet for, to me, it felt very white-facing of trying to showcase that they were the good ones, that they were out there like cleaning up. And I was... I was in this heightened emotional state in the moment and I started talking and he had his camera with him and he recorded it and I had no idea it was going to do what it did. I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, or, or look, when, when we go on our tangents and we get on our soapbox, honey, and we feel passionate about something, there's nothing that can stop us in there. But let's talk about um, how the oppression in America is designed around the economic system. I mean, I was reading up on why we were even three-fifths, considered three-fifths of a human in the Constitution, and even that had to do with economics. It had to do with how much you would be taxed. And the only reason they gave uh, Black people three-fifths of a person was so that they could account um, as a whole person for tax purposes and also for voting purposes, which tripped me out. I'm like, so, so if you had enough black slaves, if you had enough slaves, I guess you can assume they were black. If you had enough slaves, they would count towards the, uh, the electoral vote, which mm -hmm. trips me out. And I'm sure Joe, maybe you can speak to that since you are running against Maxine Waters for a congressional seat. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have to agree with, with both of you guys on this one right now. Uh, when it comes to America and the economic condition of America, when you speak of, you know, people of color being considered uh, uh, three-fourths, I think the reason why is because back then we were still considered property as indentured servants or, or slaves or what have you. And so the Constitution makes it pretty clear that if you are considered property, you are not really a person. One of the biggest issues that we have in America with people of color, you want to consider as Black people, African American, Afro American, or what, what have you, is that we have no nationality. And so until we, as people of color, are able to get our nationality, we're going to continue to be treated the same uh, across the board, no, no matter what happens. So uh, when we have politicians that have the ability to make change for us and give us a land, give us a homeland, give us something that we can say, okay, this is our, this is our nationality, this is where we come from, we're going to continue to be treated like slaves. And, and, and you know, I'm not, not to be a conspiracy theorist, but that's just the bottom line. When you say we don't have a nationality, what does that mean? 
That means we don't have a homeland. Where are we from? Are we indigenous? Were we here? I've been to the Library of Congress and I read the books and it's a lot of black people that were here and they call it the copper colored people or the Indians. We were here before slavery got here. Um, uh, and if you are, and if you are African descendant of slavery, where did you come from? Where is, what is your homeland? Where, what is African American? You know, African is an entire continent, but what country in Africa did you come from? What, 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 uh, what land in Africa did you come from? Nobody in the African community knows that you call us African American. So how can you be content American? You can't, you can't not be continent American. Or you call us black, which is the color. That's an identifier in my opinion. But where do we come from? What is our homeland? What is a, a, a location inside of a continent that we can, that we can claim as ours? And, and right now we don't have that. Hmm. Interesting thought process. Um, so explain, Kimberly, how the economics mm. break down towards, um, I guess, explain how the economics play a part in racism in America. Well, I mean, if you don't have any financial control over your own personal life or what's happening in your community, you don't have you don't have any control like the the energy of money allows you to be in on the conversation about what's happening to you. And the reason that I likened it to monopoly, because I wanted to point out the fact that there is generational wealth that is still being passed down that comes from slave money. So in the same way in which you can see that, you have to acknowledge that there is a generational debt in terms of, of Black people's ability to be at the, at the table in the same way. Oh, so, so, okay, so here's the thing. So here is the argument when people say, yeah, but I didn't have slaves. My parents didn't have slaves. My grandmother didn't have slaves. But you, your mama and your grandmama are living off that slave money. Exactly, because when you look at a company like Brooks Brothers, right? Brooks Brothers made all their original money by, by dressing the footmen and the housemen of, of the slave owners. They had a very niche market of dressing slaves. That's how the original money was made for Brooks Brothers. So now you fast forward all of this time later, there are still children that are on that board or that are receiving residual income from what's being made at Brooks Brothers when that original money was made during the slave trade. So mm -hmm. there is there are even industries in which strategically black people were kept kept out, whether you're talking about post-slavery, whether you're talking about doing the civil rights movement. A lot of times we think that this is so far away, but it's actually a lot closer than we realize. My grandmother was born in 1914. My, I was 19 when my grandmother died. I had full-on conversations. You have to, my grandmother had a conversation with her grandmother who was a slave. That's how close the conversation is. So if you, you you think about like videos you see from the 60s where you have these awful white children, this one that was circulating, running these black kids out of the, their neighborhood, those kids are now 50, 60, 70 years old. So where are they? They're in the Congress, they're in Senate, they're CEOs. So that sentiment is still, that implicit bias is still in them and controlling the narrative of how they interact with African-American people. Yeah, uh, there's a photograph of Daisy Bates, who was the first uh, woman to be integrated into a white school. And there's a photograph of this white woman that's completely outraged and yelling and screaming at her in a very devilish sort of way. And someone captured that in, photo, in, in a photo. And I've always wondered, where is that lady today? Right. This is this is not as far removed as we think it is. So if you if you don't think that the sentiments of those times are still permeating in in society in terms of the bankers and everyone who interacts with us financially, which are which are systems that were put in place by and large to, you know, to build prosperity for white Americans, if you think they're still not intentionally keeping us out of industries and growth, then, then I don't know what to say. Where do you see the black community as a whole, better or, or worse financially? 
I think in some ways we're worse. <laughs> I think in a lot of ways, financially, we, were, we are worse. Because I think, you know, I know this is cliche, everybody says this, but like, I, I think it's true. Integration was like one of the worst things that happened to us. Because prior to that, we, we were focused on ownership. And we lived in our communities, and we owned the shops, and we owned, we owned property, and we were thriving. Now, that I, and I in no way ignored the other ills that were happening in that time with the, you know, the high performance performance of the clan at that time and different things like that. But I think, you know, all of our grandparents own their home. You know what I'm saying? Like for the most part. And so I, now I, I have a home that belongs to my great grandfather, right? In 2020. I, I'm talking about great grandfather, you know, who died when he was 92 years old. Right. And that was like 15 years ago that he died. So can you imagine how old that house is? And, yeah. and and the fact that he owned it, you know. Yeah, and in some ways, I could even remove race from it. The proletariat as a whole, poor people as a whole in this country are suffering right now. Um, and that's not, you know, that's not just black people. That's 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 poor whites. That's poor Latinx people. That's poor indigenous people. Um, the amount, the difference between what a CEO makes and what an employee makes at this stage versus what a CEO and an employee made in the like in the 1950s and 60s, there's a huge gap. The difference in the 60s was about they made about somewhere between 23 and 23 and I think it was 37 percent more than their employees now it's like several hundred times that um so the the top is getting a lot heavier and you're seeing a you know and and that's why you see a lot of people not just black people very upset except I think it's a lot of misdirected anger and people are following a lot of the wrong people but I mean poor people across the board are getting poorer mm. 